Hey, good morning, uh, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, really great to have the opportunity to be able to uh, address the workforce. Been looking for an opportunity to do a global town hall for, for quite a while. We wanted to wait until the end of the fiscal year. Um, the first thing I want to say to the entire ACC workforce is, uh, one, congratulations, and, and two, thanks for a very successful year in. Uh, just tremendous work by everybody across all the centers, the Mission Installation Contracting Command, the ECC, um, and the headquarters, both at MIC, ECC, and ACC, for an outstanding uh, year in, uh, in conjunction with numerous emerging missions and workforce challenges that uh, began really no sooner than we started fiscal year 2014. So this morning what I wanted to do is give you a little bit of a, a state of the command and, and uh, where we've been just to take some stock of our accomplishments over the last year and then uh, a look toward the future. I assume that uh, either you have uh, some hard copy slides or, or an ability to tee the slides up as you know we can't transmit them. So I will, uh, I'll tell you which slide we're on and then uh, I'll move forward. So just with the agenda, I won't cover this in detail. Um, they mentioned uh, the uh, framework we're using for questions. I think uh, under the circumstances, I understand we have over 100 sites connected in on this VTC. Uh, that's probably the most effective way to uh, at least entertain some of your questions. There's no doubt we're not going to get to all of them in the uh, limited time we have. Going to the next slide, fiscal year 2014 recap. In my last Gold Eagle 6 note, I sent out an attachment that went into a little bit more detail on some of the numerous accomplishments that the command uh, uh, was able to do this past year. This is just a small recap. Uh, behind the $50 billion in obligations and 130,000 actions, the, uh, the super success we did on small business and competition this year was really phenomenal. And as you know, uh, we really carry the Army on small business. We carry AMC and we carry the Army. And so it was our performance that allowed the United States Army to be able to be successful in the small business category, even in hub zone, which uh, we knew was going to be challenging. Change and uncertainty. I mentioned uh, right from day one in 2014, uh, we were faced with uh, furloughs, sequestration, government shutdown. Uh, I know within a lot of your organizations, we've been adapting to a lot of uh, transition as the Army repositions itself, uh, gets smaller, and those are going to those things are going to continue. And I'll talk a little bit more about those uh, shortly. Um, but one of the things I I do want to say is the uh, the headquarters here, through the help of you in the field. We saw very quickly the environment we were going to be going into, and we were able to, I think, really hit some of the challenges head on in terms of being able to articulate risk and uh, potential reductions within the contracting workforce, get senior leader attention both at AMC and at ASALT, and put together a plan and a strategy uh, to try to be successful. And just some measure of success you know, shortly after AMC introduced the uh, hiring restrictions on the entire Army Materiel Command, we developed our uh, plan to get down to those targets, tracked our progress, and very quickly came back up on the net uh, to General Vi and said, you know, sir, we are going to we're going to overshoot that target um, at very significant cost to our customers and supported units if we're not careful. And and he allowed us to put together an alter, alternate strategy. And we're now the only um, organization within AMC that does not have those hiring restrictions. We were the first, the only organization that was able to approve overtime at a lower level. The bottom line is, is they recognize the unique uh, characteristics of our workforce, the high attrition rate, uh, the fact that if you take your foot off the gas, you know, you very quickly get down to a point that's very difficult to rebuild. And how what we do impacts the ability of the other organizations within AMC and the Army to support their mission. 
And so uh, I think very successful in terms of our, us being able to mitigate what could have been a very disastrous downturn in resources. Um, also, uh, uh, at the same time, the entire Army's work in audit readiness. Uh, our team here, as well as you in the field, I think we're on a path to to really support the entire Army audit readiness program, uh, even as we take care of our own internal processes. You know, we activated a number of uh, new uh, military force uh, structure uh, organizations in terms of the two CONUS based brigades and the center battalions. Uh, these are important. On the brigade side, it gives us a deployable ability to support the CONUS-based Army, which is, is, as I said, is becoming more CONUS-based and expeditionary. And the battalions located at our centers gives us the ability to provide an opportunity for our soldiers to be able to get the kinds of contracting experience that they don't necessarily get in the MIC and at ECC. And so that's something that we, we're going to try to preserve even if we are uh, faced with some pressure to re reduce our force structure. As you know, we are planning simultaneously for a number of, of new missions. Uh, the Contingency Contract Administration Services mission from DCMA, uh, and then also planning for AFCAN next, and then most recently the uh, Crisis Action Response uh, for uh, Operation United Assistance in West Africa. I think the staff has done a tremendous job of, uh, of introducing some new capabilities, both in structure processes uh, here at the headquarters. The MAP app is one that we've gotten rave reviews on, uh, and also uh, the team working with all of the representatives from the field and uh, the Army contract writing system. We passed our uh, milestone decision this year, and we're moving forward with that. One of the things that... Uh, that Ms. Shu asked us to do uh, in terms of the ability to leverage what Army Contracting Command brings to the Army is to establish a consolidated single HCA. And there were policy ramifications, process ramifications, and also structure ramifications to that. And I think the team has done an <clears throat> incredible job of putting that together. And there was a lot of resistance to that concept, especially at the uh, Life Cycle Management Commands. And what we had been telling them all along is this is going to actually, we think, streamline the process because we're going to push more authority out to our parks in the field. And that has actually been the case, and I'll talk about that as well. You go to the next slide on strategic planning. Uh, when I first took command, I took a look at the the vision, mission, and, and uh, strategic priorities that General Nichols had laid out, and I actually thought they were pretty good. And so we have used those for the first uh, year uh, of my tenure. But recently, I, what I wanted to do was, was uh, refine these a little bit more. And, uh, and I, instead of going with a vision, uh, it's more of a statement of purpose. You know, why... Why the Army Contracting Command? And what I've tried to capture is, you know, if you look at every recent major conflict that the United States Army has been involved in, one of the key strategic ace in the hole, if you will, has been our ability to leverage our industrial base and the free enterprise system to be able to provide warfighters with material and more recently services uh, to be able to uh, uh, conduct operations. And we do that not only here in CONUS, but we have taken that much further to the soldiers on the front line in recent years with our expeditionary contracting capability. And that is where we really provide that critical value added to the soldier in the field to the United States Army. So our mission is to be able to deliver those contracted solutions anywhere, anytime, in support of the Army, in support of unified land operations. Next slide on strategic priorities. I'm not going to go over these in detail. I'll probably highlight a few. Um, I put together uh, a team that's starting to take a look at that mission and vision and then taking some initial strategic priorities and then being able to measure our ability to support those. And so I've started with this, the set of strategic priorities you see on the, the slide. 
and uh, this team is going to take that and develop a strategic plan that really goes down to the uh, objective and metric for each of those uh, so that we can be able to track our progress. Um, we've been waiting to get through the end of the fiscal year. We're through that, and uh, both the chief of staff here, Colonel Zabura, and Gene Duncan are going to be leading that effort. Just a couple of the uh, priorities. Um, obviously, expeditionary contracting is important, so we we uh, we have covered that because that kind of goes into our warfighting support, but also our ability to to manage the execution of Army programs. And then the other piece, uh, and this uh, may be something that uh, uh, is really aligned with, with the MIC and some degree to the ECC, we have a lot of customers out there that aren't professional acquisition experts. And trying to support them is, is, is somewhat of a challenge. And so that's one of the things that I think we help bring to the Army is supporting those kinds of customers. Okay, let me go to the next slide because uh, I want to give uh, time for questions. I talked about some emerging missions, and the CCAS mission has been uh, really sort of headed our way for a couple of years now, and after some engagements with OSD about whether we really wanted to transition the CCAS mission from BCMA to the, the services, um, we got clear direction this year that that was going to be the services mission, and as you know, that affects the Army more than any other military service because we have the lion's share of boots on the ground, log cap support, and other major contracted support uh, for uh, forces that are deployed. So we laid out a transition plan for DCMA. Uh, there were three near-term, uh, relatively near-term targets that we had requirements for, both in Africa and uh, uh, Central Africa for uh, Operation Observing Compass, which was a small log cap mission. And then we had the uh, log cap and other major contracts supporting uh, RCENT in the Kuwait area. And then finally, we had the larger mission in Afghanistan uh, to support. And so we have developed a transition plan that supports all those. We've actually assumed mission in Africa. On the 11th of December, we're going to assume the mission in December. And we are leveraging our expeditionary force structure to do that. It'll be the first time that we've deployed battalion and teams that are primarily focused on supporting CCAS. This also has larger ramifications uh, for the Army Contracting Command because this is a capability that we only have a limited capacity to perform, both in terms of numbers of people and in terms of skill sets. We have a relatively um, uh, immature, still developing skill set in uh, quality assurance, even less so in property management. This is a capability that we really need to be able to bring the full spectrum of contracting support to the Army, and we have a team working very hard on putting that together. In January of 2016, we're scheduled to take the uh, uh, CCAS mission in Afghanistan. Uh, of course, a lot of uh, Time between now and then, and uh, Afghan is, uh, Afghanistan is uh, uh, changing almost monthly as we speak. So we'll see what that mission looks like uh, when we get to that point. Afghan next. As you know, that contracting in, in Iraq and Afghanistan was stood up in a relatively ad hoc basis. They finally put together a contracting support team uh, really based on a joint task force or a DOD contracting command starting with Joint Contracting Command and then Joint Theater Support Contracting Command. Um, if there had been an Expeditionary Contracting Command in 2003, I'm convinced that the Army would have that mission first in Iraq and then in Afghanistan. So now they are transitioning that Sajitsik mission that's uh, supporting uh, operations in Afghanistan to the Army. We are planning to transition that uh, in the March-June 2015 timeframe. Uh, we're still uh, uh, putting together sort of final uh, plans for exactly how that transition will occur, but generally speaking, we will plan on support, uh, deploying the 418th Contracting Support Brigade out of Fort Hood, Texas, and several uh, teams and a battalion to support that mission. Uh, so very exciting times in terms of the emerging missions uh, that the, uh, the Army is going to be conducting over the next several years. You know, I like to say, just as the Army, you know, in its dialogue with OSD and Congress, 
says, you know, we keep here and don't need boots on the ground anymore. Well, the Army sure is operating in a lot of different places around the world. The same can be said for contracting. You know, those that say, well, you know, dollars are coming down and, uh, you know, we're going to be a, a different Army and maybe we don't need the contracting force structure. I say, well, we sure are operating in a lot of places around the world and being asked to do more over the next couple of uh, months and years. So good, interesting times uh, going forward. If you go to the next slide, um, in terms of uh, the resource picture, um, probably the number one thing affecting the resources for the entire Department of Defense, the Army, and, and in turn us, is uh, sequestration. And if you understand how the Budget Control Act works, it is a hard set of constraints put on the uh, military in terms of the total budget picture for the next 10 years. What a lot of people don't realize is the last couple of years there's been some supplemental funds that have been injected into the Department of Defense that have mitigated this. Um, we're not going to get those funds in the future, and, and, and based on what we are hearing and engaging with Congress and other senior leaders, uh, sequestration may be here to stay. That's going to have very dramatic implications for the Department of Defense in 2016 if it's not changed. And so uh, while I think FY 2015 is going to be a moderate belt tightening, I think in 2016, uh, if, if nothing changes, we have to prepare ourselves for some uh, – some drastic reductions in our resources. Um, that's going to cause us to really take a look at how we uh, support our, our, our uh, organizations, where we're located, how we do things. Now, at the same time, I will tell you that that will also mean that the federal budget and the Army budget will come down, and so workload will probably come down as well. So far, the challenge has been our, our resource constraints have been pulled in faster than workloads going down. And that's been uh, the main risk area that I've been highlighting to uh, AMC and Army leaders. Um, but I'll tell you, uh, both General Vi and Miss Yu and, and, and more Army and uh, senior leaders are recognizing the importance of contracting and what we bring to the table. And I'll tell you, at AUSA, uh, it came out in spades. Uh, Ms. Shu at a panel discussion spent probably 10 minutes talking about the contracting workforce in terms of one of the things that keeps her up at night, our ability to be able to resource that mission. And the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army was on the front row, and he was taking notes. Um, so th we, are, we, are, uh, we do have advocates, uh, both at AMC and uh, on the Army staff. Um, Going uh, to single HCA, I, I won't talk too much about it because I spoke about it before, but as I said, um, basically a very successful transition into that. And you can see we've had only a few items that have been elevated to the HCA, which is General Vi now at AMC headquarters. And the timelines to resolve uh, things that uh, go to his level for, uh, for uh, approval have been really amazingly short. Uh, in some cases, in the matter of a, a couple hours or days, and uh, we have delegated a lot of authority to the parks now to be able to um, uh, provide oversight so that we can be more streamlined in our approach to things. So uh, a very good success story on that. One of the things, and I, and I didn't really cover it on uh, the uh, – uh, emerging missions, um, and it's related to the single HCA. There is a plan right now that we are uh, developing, and it will take Ms. Hsu's approval, that will potentially pull uh, the contracting center at PEO Stry under ACC also. And this is just an effort to try to, to further streamline uh, the contracting support for the Army. Now, a lot of people ask the question, what about these other contracting organizations in the Corps and INSCOM and so forth? Um, I think <clears throat> those organizations and that contracting, off those offices are, are much more significant. There are rules that, uh, that govern their support. And so I'm not saying that would never happen, but it's probably something that would take 
a lot more analysis uh, in terms of, uh, of combining into ACC. So I get that question from time to time, but I don't see that happening in the next year or two. But with regard to uh, PEO Stry, I think that would be probably a good fit. I think the PEO Stry believes that would be a good fit, and so uh, we are headed down um, that direction. Um, let me talk a little bit about resiliency uh, on slide nine. One of the things that uh, you know that would, is is really apparent this year as we go through this year, a lot of stressors both on the workforce in terms of the change that occur, and then also um, um, you know just in your personal life. And the Army has really uh, tried to tackle uh, resiliency in a holistic uh, fashion. If you look at the chart, you know talks about stress, it talks about the management of what you do, uh, and it's a continuum. And uh, resiliency really occurs in terms of how we uh, prepare ourselves, prepare our employees to be able to manage change, to manage stress in the work life, and also uh, uh, their personal life as well. And then if you, if you look at stress, if you go to the, the next uh, slide in terms of resiliency defined, the ability to bounce back from adversity. You know, a lot of people define stress as the difference between what is occurring in your environment, whether it's adversity or change or whatever, and your own perception of what your environment should be. So when those two don't match, that tends to stress people out. And then sometimes it comes from strain, uh, from change. Sometimes it comes from uh, just a change in environment. And so how we deal with that. Uh, and sometimes it's the ability to change yourself to be able to accommodate, you know, the adversity in your life or the change in your life. And sometimes it's adjusting to the new reality, you know, that we're of change and adversary, uh, adversity. And so, uh, you know, these are two uh, definitions that, uh, that, come, uh, that come to mind. Um, but one of the things that's important is that we as an organization, as individuals, be able to uh, uh, exercise resiliency and be able to develop resiliency within our organizations. Some uh, uh, resources relative to resilience uh, in terms of being able to deal with stress and adversity uh, in work or, or even uh, in our private lives or on the next page in terms of uh, uh, some medical and counseling, um, and probably the most extreme uh, manifestation of, uh, of a lack of resiliency is the uh, is the suicides that we often see in our work in our workforce. This is something that the military has been dealing with for uh, several years. Um, but uh, as many of you know, we had a, a suicide in our headquarters, and so it really was manifest in a very difficult way over. Uh, the last several weeks at ACC. I think the stand down day that General Vi asked us to do, or the, the, the hour that we took right after the fiscal year, is, is a good way to try to uh, approach this on, on a periodic basis. It's something that I plan on uh, implementing more in the future. You've got to take, your to take the time <coughs> to get off email, uh, to get off uh, you know, all the stuff that we're doing and really set folks down and see how they're doing, whether you walk around or you put folks uh, in a room and uh, look people in the eye and really see how um, your workforce is and what challenges that they're having uh, in their daily lives. We're getting close to questions, uh, so uh, I'm going to pull up this uh, uh, iPad. Um, that has the questions coming in, and I'll uh, I'll take a couple of them. Uh, one of them is uh, would I consider offering the workforce the option for a compressed work schedule that would consist of a four day, ten hours a day? Um, I'd consider doing uh, a lot of different things relative to alternate schedule and workforce. One of this, but let me let me just articulate. Uh, some of the things that I think are important when we make that, when we consider that. And one of them is the supported organization that you support and how your 
work schedule matches up with them. I think that's one of the primary considerations when you're uh, when we adapt our work schedule or change it. And whether you're a brigade that supports an Army division or an Army Service Component Command or you're a center that supports a Life Cycle Management Command or PEOs, I think one of the things we got to take into consideration is how our work schedule impacts our customers. And so uh, the easy answer is to say, yeah, absolutely consider doing those things. I have operated in uh, organizations that had alternate work schedule uh, many times in the past. I think it, uh, it has a lot of uh, pros to it in terms of giving people that day off during the week or, or that um, where they can you know, take care of business that they might not be able to do. But one of the things I'm always cognizant of is how it affects the uh, organization in which we support. So probably not a, a, a total answer to your question, but giving you an idea of you know, my thought process as I consider um, uh, that issue. Um, can we link the map app uh, or, or can a link for the map app be put on the ACC webpage and on ACC SharePoint homepage? It's currently not easily found. Um, sounds like an easy fix. I'll, uh, I'm getting a thumbs up from uh, both the G6 and the contract ops folks, so that's an easy question. Um, the depots and arsenals have relief on hiring restrictions. Um, so let me address that topic, because I, I think I know where that question emanates from in a holistic um, uh, perspective. As I said before, we're looking at potentially uh, significant reductions in 16. Um, if that occurs, we want to be in a position where we have not overhired, uh, because if we do that, then we are faced with maybe having to implement workforce reshaping, which is code for rift, as everybody knows. We don't want to do that. Right now, we, I think, are on a, a track that we won't have to worry about those reshaping tools. And so we're being very, very careful as we go forward, working with center directors, working with the ECC, working with the MIC, to to look to look into the future and say if we are reduced by our workforce, what's the most efficient way to get work done the best? Um, and so we're being cautious. Um, and I won't say we're not going to hire any positions at uh, at uh, smaller contracting offices and depots, but we're going to be careful as we do so. So we have kind of put the brakes on in terms of uh, our dialogue with the centers. And we're going to have a dialogue with them in terms of what makes sense, because the last thing we want to do is to get ourselves in a position where we might have to, to do a riff at any place. And if we can um, be cautious and do a little bit more reach back in the near term until the resource picture in 2016 becomes more clear, that's what we're going to do. So I can't tell you exactly when or how much, but... I, I can tell you we're being very careful as we go forward. We're trying to work with your leadership so that we don't get ourselves in a position where we're going to have to engage in any reshape operations. Okay, next question is uh, really related to military force structure. With all of the High deployment and op tempo, will we, military, be able to get 100% of our authorizations? Well, I certainly hope so. And one of the things that I hope uh, to be able to do over the next year is to leverage the missions that we're being asked to do as we go through the TAA process to make the case that right now is not the time to be cutting any workforce, either military or civilian, uh, because of all of the activity that we've got going on. You know, when you look at the CCAS mission, when you look at our Afghan Next and uh, uh, operations to support Ebola in West Africa, you know, that actually lends itself very well to the argument on the military force structure. So my expectation is that we're going to be able to get filled cl at close to or 100% of our current authorizations, but more importantly, that we will uh, hopefully not take as many reductions. Now, 
the army is, you know, is is going from uh, an army of 570 to 490 and now to 450. So we probably are going to have to take some force structure reductions. But my view is we should not go down at, at a percentage greater than the army until we've got a good model to be able to determine what the expeditionary contracting requirement is for the army. And right now, that's that. There's not a good model to show that. Uh, so we're working uh, over the next year to try to mitigate that. Will the Army contract writing system have an incorporated database to assist and manage workload? And uh, if not, why are we purchasing it? Um, so my uh, expectation and what uh, has been agreed to thus far is that the Army contract writing system will have all of the capability current con currently contained in PADS and PD2 as well as VCE. And VCE does have a workload management module in it. Um, so as it stands now, the Army uh, contract writing system will include that capability. As everybody knows, the devil's in the detail. And so we have a, a requirements team, um, both represented here at the headquarters and represented by people in the field as we go through this process to make sure that those capabilities are going to be resident in the future system. So I'm glad to tell you that my intention is, is yes. Right now we have an agreement that yes, it will include that, and uh, that's where we're going to go forward. Um, that's what we have, sir. I'm running out of questions. You guys need to text more. <laughs> okay, I've got a couple more as a, as a kind of a spare set while you guys are texting in more questions. Um, what does the future military deployment cycle look like with regards to the emerging missions that I spoke about? Um, right now we have a fairly good idea of what requirements are going to be in, in Kuwait for CCAS and certainly Africa. Uh, Afghan next. Uh, we have an initial idea of what resources are going to take to do that mission. Uh, but as Afghanistan develops, uh, potentially goes down in requirements and structure, that could change. Uh, in e in the West Africa for Operation United Response, or United Assistance, sorry, uh, we have an idea of what we're going with, in with initially, but I don't know how long that mission will last, and I don't know how large it can grow. So. One of the things that I will tell you is if you look out uh, a year from now, uh, we potentially could have four brigades deployed and uh, uh, several, or excuse me, two brigades deployed, four battalions deployed, and uh, numerous teams and, and civilian augment, uh, augmentation. Um, that will eventually get us to a dwell of about two to one, which is the limit at which the Army likes to be at. Uh, and so our op tempo is, is there. There's not going to be any shortage of opportunities for uh, contingency missions, over, at least over the next couple of years. And, uh, and you never know when uh, a natural disaster might occur around the world or any other kind of contingency. Truth is... Um, to be honest, probably right now there is more going on in the Army uh, in terms of world contingency missions than I think at any other time since I began serving in 1981. Uh, so um, a lot of op tempo in terms of uh, deployments going forward. Um, One question, uh, and, the, and I apologize, these are a little bit military focused. Um, I'll go back and take a look at my iPad here uh, and see if I can get some, some different ones. Um, and this is on the alignment. What is the intent with BCT, division alignment with CCTs, battalions, etc.? cetera? Um, and, and the question really uh, centers around that some of the CT the contingency contracting teams that are, say, co-located with the division aren't necessarily aligned to the brigade combat teams. And that is true. We are aligned at the brigade level, 
to both Corps and Army Service Component Commands and were aligned at the contracting battalion level to Army divisions. At the CCT level, we have enough forces that are apportioned for the, the brigade combat teams, the sustainer brigades, but there's not an alignment. And the reason that there's not an alignment is because when you get down to that level, it, it becomes too difficult to ensure that we have a contingency contracting team that is ready to go and deploy as a particular BCT is ready. So they are kind of in a global pool. Now, that said, as we're training at the National Training Center and as we're deploying to support um, Army units, where possible, we try to align or at least deploy with a team that maybe has a habitual uh, relationship with a, a BCT or a number of BCTs at home station. But there is not an alignment at the team level, and that's the reason. All right, let me go back. There should be about three here, sir. Okay. Next question, is there a timetable in place to fully roll together ACC and ECC headquarters onto a, a single TDA. So when we stood up ACC and ECC uh, back in 2008-2009, neither the ACC staff or the ECC staff was fully resourced. And since that time, there's been at least one concept plan to try to accomplish that, and it was not approved. So we found ourselves when we move the commands down to Redstone that neither command was, was fully resourced. And uh, before me, General Nichols had already started to um, integrate some of the staff functions together in an ability to, you know, get some synergy uh, off of that supporting both the ACC and the ECC. Um, we decided to do that with all the staff sections over the past year. And so we do have an integrated integrated staff. But my vision is that those headquarters, the ECC and the ACC at the command group level especially, will stay separate uh, commands. And to do that, I want to keep the TDAs, but this is simply a paper drill on separate documents. In terms of how we actually operate, it is an integrated staff that supports both commands. Um, but I want to keep the uh, the uh, organizations on separate TDAs. And there's a couple of practical reasons for that. Uh, one is which is the, the TDA of the ECC is considered an operational TDA, much like an Army Service Component Command. It supports operations. And in so, uh, some cases, they are less vulnerable to reductions than other generating force TDAs. And so by putting everybody on one TDA, I might make the entire headquarters vulnerable to uh, generating force reductions. And I'm re reluctant to do that. Um, and the other reason is because I want to keep those TDAs separate to at least be able to show the Army on paper, you know, the resources uh, that are apportioned to each capability. But in terms of the way we operate, it's an integrated staff. It's one staff for both, com both commands. It is far from perfect. It's not the best way. Uh, if I had my brothers to operate, I'd resource both commands adequately and, and operate them as, as separate commands uh, because we're already seeing uh, just in the last couple of months, you know, several possible scenarios where uh, we might at least deploy a portion of the ECC headquarters. Not that we would, but we see several scenarios where that, that uh, would be the case. And so that's why, in terms of actually combining the TDAs, I don't have a plan currently to do that. Again, as I think I might have answered this already, is the user community involved in providing comment slash input into what would be included as capabilities in the ACWS? In the macro sense, those capabilities have already been determined, what's going to be included in our contract writing system. But in ter as I said before, kind of devils in the details, as we go through this process, you know, exactly what specific capability within a category 
um, we want. So um, there are limited funds. So I'm sure when we start getting down into specific details, there's going to be trade-offs that are going to have to occur in terms of how we are going to give the field the opportunity to participate in that. We have a user group that really comes from across the Army, a lot of representatives within ACC. Uh, but in addition to that, I think there's actually a share port, uh, portal that gives the field an opportunity to, uh, to actually comment on the performance work statement of the draft and the capabilities that are in there. And we've been getting feedback from uh, people, not just within ACC, but throughout the Army in terms of 1102s. So there is that mechanism to do that. Um, how do you see the Army Reserve contracting support to be used in support of contingency operations? Um, I think the reserves uh, and the National Guard together uh, have a re very relevant role to play in uh, contracting, and, and we've seen that. I mean, we have gone uh, uh, to war over the past 10 years with the reserves and the National Guard, and that includes Army contracting. We've had several Guard soldiers uh, deploy in support of OIF and OEF, the same with the reserve, and, uh, and they've been extremely effective. What I think is going to be the challenge for the reserve and the guard going forward is the ability to keep their people trained. Um, they've been relying very heavily on 852 money to be able to take a soldier, whether guard or reserve, that is not an 1102 in their regular uh, daily life, and most of them are not, and bring them on active duty for a year and train them with a uh, active duty contracting office to get them uh, trained, and then deploy them for a year. And then when they come back off of deployment, um, they may not touch a contract for, for several years. So that's a challenging way to try to train and maintain the training for a very technical workforce. And so that's where I see the challenge. So one of the things that we have got to be able to do within the Guard and the Reserve is be able to get a training framework that's effective, that trains folks and keeps them trained with the resources we have to do it. And I think the, the degree to which we're able to do that will determine how much Reserve and National Guard force structure it makes sense to leverage um, in support of Army contracting. Okay. I'm not totally sure I understand this question. Uh, maybe the staff can help me out here. Why are we required to complete the on-site CES training if the Army is cutting our spending? You want to take that? Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Schneider, or Mr. Schneider, the, uh, the uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Manpower and Reserve Affairs, last week at AUSA said that the Army is del making a deliberate decision in this drawdown to not reduce tr uh, money that is spent on civilian training, unlike what they've done in the past. They want to keep the emphasis on developing and training the civilians, even though we're coming down in a budget, because they, the Army recognizes the importance of doing that. So it's a conscious decision to do that. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Um, one of them, what are my views on teleworking? Is it only for contracting officers and can contract specialists telework too? I don't think there's any restrictions on what functional people can leverage teleworking. But tele, you know, teleworking um, to be effective has to be planned. There has to be a telework agreement, as, as most of you know. And so I would say follow the process. But in terms of, of you know, just broad sweeping who's eligible for it, there aren't restrictions that say just this particular career field or this particular career field. And I think that uh, that uh, used, um, in, you know, in a targeted way, I think it could be very effective. But it has to be planned and it has to be an agreement between the person and the supervisor and there has to be a rationale for it. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I would kind of leave it at that. Um, the next question, um, and the last one that I have, will VCE go away after the new Army contracting uh, writing system is fielded? 
And if so, will all current and planned functionality exist in Army contract writing system or acquisition support center product? So my, the vision is, is that, that the functionality within VCE will get rolled up into Army contract writing system and VCE as we know it right now won't exist. If the functionality will be an Army contract writing system. So what if we can't get all the functionality that's in VCE into the Army contract writing system? So then we've got a choice to make. We pick the things that are the highest priority to us, and that's what gets included in Army contract writing system, and the rest fall off the table. Or is there an ability, because it's cheaper for whatever reason, that we can keep some kind of a residual VCE framework to be able to continue with those functions? Those are uh, issues that I don't have an answer for yet, but I can tell you that my intent is to, as much as possible, all of the functionality within VCE be incorporated into Army contract writing system. But until we get proposals from contractors, until we see what is offered and how much it costs, some of those uh, questions become unknowns. Um, but I want you to know that it is my intent that we're able to provide that functionality with an Army contract writing system. Okay. An increase in local authority was mentioned. Can we expect more local authority to re re review and approve actions? We are experiencing delays in the CSB reviews and approvals. CSB is? Contracts for Wayne and Park. Oh, CSB. Okay, got it. Uh, park level reviews. Um, I think in some cases that that may be true, but I will tell you that there are other uh, there are other cases when I look at you know PMR results and so forth um, <coughs> that I do worry that in some cases we're not reviewing things uh, in a holistic fashion. So my view would be where we can where we can assume risk, we push it down to the lowest possible level. But it's not uh, unfortunately a one size fits all. I think there are uh, environments where we have to maintain a higher level of review. But uh, in general, you know, review at the lowest level is always going to contribute to a more streamlined process. Uh, in fact, that's one of the things I think we're wrestling with uh, overall within the department is whenever some issue is found on a, a DODIG or a AAA audit or a GAO uh, review or something like that, you know, uh, congressional or OSD answer is to, you know, imp improve the the uh, review process or make it more onerous and I don't think that's really the way to go um, but you know some I have the the uh, discretion on some of this but on some of this I don't Mike would you add anything on that well the only thing I would say is is you know as we move into an era of, of reduced resources we're going to have to look at the degree to which things come up to a higher headquarters and we'll you know just like we did in the 90s when we had the drawdown in the 90s will probably be an emphasis at some point to do some powering down right now it doesn't it doesn't appear as though there's any impetus in that direction coming from OSD but i think just intuitively i would suspect that we will move in that direction eventually okay I'm going to I'm going to give it about two or three more minutes for some more questions. We're just about out of time anyway, even though I think we can run a little bit longer. Um, but um, I, I want to give uh, uh, a couple of my battle buddies here just an operation, uh, an opportunity to make some uh, additional remarks. And uh, uh, first, I'm going to go to Command Sergeant Major Quigg if he's got any. Cool. Thank you, sir. I, again, uh, just to echo the CG's words at the beginning of the town hall. Um, you know, as I travel around and I look at the workforce, I, I am absolutely impressed at what you all do every day. Uh, the work uh, to g keep the Army running that most folks in the Army have no clue is being done on their behalf. So I will continue as I travel, I will continue to uh, tell your story to every senior leader that I can grab on to. Uh, and I will open up doors as I can because I think we've got to be engaged with the, uh, the rest of the Army to tell the story about what we do. 
Uh, as long as we're quiet professionals and stay behind the curtains making things happen, uh, we don't get the, uh, the resources uh, you know, because of our relevancy. One key takeaway I want to pass on to you all from last week during AUSA, and this was the, really the theme of AUSA, and, uh, and that is you know, the trusted professional. Um, now, this was given in the, in the idea that all folks in the military, all, all folks in the Army need to be trusted professionals but no more so than in this command and within this community, uh, you know, in the contracting community. And it's not just the trusted professional of, you know, today, but it's the trusted professional for the future as well. So I, I want you all to, to, you know, think about that. What does it mean to be a trusted professional? You know, what does it mean uh, to continue to be a trusted professional for the future? And, and I'll talk about that as I travel, and I'll discuss this a bit when I uh, get all the uh, sergeants majors together uh, here in about an hour uh, for another VTC. Uh, but again, I appreciate everything you do uh, on the behalf of the, you know, thousands of senior leaders out there that have no clue what this command does and this workforce does. You know, I thank you on their behalf. Sir, that's all I got. All right. Thanks, Sergeant Major. My, uh, Mr. Hutchinson, a few words? Yeah. Um, one of the things that when I was at AUSA last week, one of the things that, that came out that, quite frankly, um, was really shocking to me is there was some discussion in the uh, SCS symposium and in the, uh, the civilian uh, workshop that took place during AUSA. There was some discussion about the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey that was just completed. What was shocking in that, in the results of that survey, is that the Army was second to last in how its civilian workforce viewed its employer as in, in terms of being a desirable place to work. Um, we were just right above the Department of Homeland Security, which has been a, a basement dweller in terms of employee satisfaction since the day it was founded. That is not a place that the Army wants to be, and it's not a place that I want our workforce to be. So I'm, I'm working with our G1, and we're going to develop over the next year kind of a comprehensive um, human capital strategy that's going to look at a whole host of things, training, development, work, uh, workplace satisfaction, that we're going to we'll pull people in from across the command to get their input and their viewpoints on this. But we want to be able about a year from now to put this in place so that we can get after how our civilian workforce views the Army and views ACC as a desirable place to work. So um, you have my commitment to that. Um, we all got to work 40 hours a week. It might as well not be a miserable experience. So I want to I work with you guys to not make it a miserable experience. So more to come on that. That's all I got, sir. All right. So let me close the way I started and, uh, and just tell you how proud I am of the uh, Army Contracting Command workforce. Uh, the things that you do under the conditions that you do it are amazing. And I, I get feedback from, from Army, DOD, and, and, and senior leaders all the time in terms of the great work that you're doing. And I, you know, I try to put that out and express that uh, feedback when I get it, but I probably are, uh, don't always get an opportunity to do that. But, it, but what you do is incredible. There's nothing that the Army, that the Department of Defense does that does not include contracting. There's not a thing. You can't eat it. You can't shoot it. You can't ride on it without a contract in place. And, uh, and so what we do is absolutely critical. And I will tell you, whether you're a contract specialist or whether you're a HR professional or whether you're a budget analyst supporting the mission, uh, everything that this command does is absolutely key and critical to the mission of the United States Army and to, and to the country. And for that, I'm really proud of you, and I, I just uh, applaud you for everything you do. So uh, look forward to seeing you in the field. I'm going to uh, try to get a new round uh, as soon as I recharge my batteries, get a new round of visits in so I can see you uh, where you work, and I look forward to it. Cool.